come once again to discuss things. to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Part 2. Joining me today is the one and only Ruben DeBoard, a.k.a. the Comics Kid 2099, and also Deadpoolzilla. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Ia, Ia un shaga. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so Ruben kind of picked what we were talking about tonight. He picked the general consensus of what we're talking about tonight, and I helped us decide on which story... Uh, so, Ruben, what are we talking about tonight? We are talking about the H.P. Lovecraft novella. Uh, I guess it's a novella. I don't know which point it becomes a novella and stops being a short story, but uh, At the Mountains of Madness. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what made you want to talk about H.P. Lovecraft? Uh, well, uh, ever since I was like a sophomore in high school, I think that's when I first heard about H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, I've always been very interested in getting into this universe the the old gods these you know gigantic alien gods that have been around for bazillions of years and there's cults that worship them and stuff like that i've always been really interested in that mythology and i just never got around to reading it and uh a couple weeks ago i finally realized most of these stories are in the public domain so i could just read them on the internet and so i read the first few the ones that came out chronologically first uh and then we i skipped to this one because this was the one we were going to talk about tonight and um i don't know what it is about it that it's not what i expected it to be um it's what what hooked me what got me interested at first is not the prominent thing that's there at the forefront of the stories that i've read yeah yeah okay um and this is weird for me because i've read a bit of hp lovecraft here and there and i do quite like his writings but um this is, I think, the thing I enjoyed the least to the point where I actually think it's not good, mm-hmm. uh, which is interesting. How about you, to Bullzilla? What's your re- reaction to this? It's not my favorite of the H.P. Lovecraft stories, which, funny enough, when I, I first read this at a public library, um, and it was in the graphic novel collection, because this I was I read a version that was readapted by Alan Moore. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. And, but this... This is not one of my favorite novel uh, um, stories by um, by Lovecraft. I could point to like ten different ones that I would really enjoy writing mo- reading more. And honestly, if you want a frozen kind of t- uh, isolation terror novel, go read The Terror. Um, it's not a it's not a Lovecraft story, but it's definitely Lovecrafty in in storytelling. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um... For me, what gets me about this one is so much of what I liked about other Lovecraft stories I've read has been the creative use of lack of detail to convey horror and shock. And this has got to be the most monotonously detailed writing I've read by Lovecraft, period. End of story. Just like every single thing. Thing is outlined in excruciating detail. He walks you through stuff so much to the point where it's interesting at first and it's weird and creepy at first and then it just gets boring as shit and I just want to like, I want to read an abridged version of this story mm-hmm. more than I want to read this story. Um, so that's why I was very disappointed by this one to be honest. This, this yeah, story... Oh, sorry, Ruben. Uh, this story, I think, is like, what, 60 pages? It easily could have been 40. It could have been 20. Uh, um, yeah. Like, there's there's details that I think are important, and if not for the, like, just myriad amount of details you get, they'd seem more obvious than they end up being when it all comes to a payoff, but it's just not worth the trip. It's like, I, I called what the ending was going to be, um, not super early, but I realized what the big reveal of the, the story was going to be at a certain point, and it's just, 
even after I realized that there's just so much more setup for it. And I'm like, I get it. It's it's just too much. Um and again, I what I loved about some other Lovecraft stories I read is the things he would do with lack of detail to convey uh, a message to his stuff. Like he would do a great job of of having characters be absolutely terrified by something and there'd be just descriptions of words do not describe the horror I saw. Words cannot describe the horror I saw. There are no words for it. And that is such a much more effective and to the point way to convey horror than anything that happens in this story. Like, I would classify this more as a sci-fi story than a horror story, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, where do we want to go from here? Because that's... Um, We're not going to do a six-minute podcast. (laughs) Well, I think the thing with this novel... is, And the weird thing is, like, long before I read this, um, and... I really want this was a story I always wanted to read because major HP Lovecraft fans are like, Oh, the mountains of madness, all oh, the mountains of madness. And when I read it I was like, This is one of his best work, like, like Okay. And I'm, I'm a little I feel a little cheated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I it sounds like you guys are more familiar with his works than I am, because I've only read like four or five and i don't even remember all of the one like the titles of the ones i've read all of them kind of blur together for me um it seems like so far the ones i've read they all kind of follow the same pattern of some nameless protagonist like i don't even think i i don't remember if this story even mentions the name of the narrator of the at the mountains of madness but you've got some nameless protagonist with very little characterization or personality basically just telling the audience okay here's what happened and then they discover something maybe it's an island maybe it's a hidden city maybe it's hieroglyphs whatever and then someone goes crazy like that's kind of the that just the all-encompassing pattern that he seems to be following at least in the stories i've read are there so you guys both said these are some this is not one of your favorites what are some better ones and like how do they avoid being as not great as this one for me, it's The well, Whisper of Darkness. Okay, that one I've not read. For me, it's Colors Out of Space. Colors Out of Space is a legitimately genius story. And, like, it's got kind of a nameless protagonist who just, like, hears a story and relays it to you. So he's not really, like, the central character or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's... one's just about, like, the the slow process of this family going crazy because of exposure to things from the, the realm of Cthulhu. Um that and like shadow over insmith is closer to what you're talking about but it's just it's got a much more haunting creepy uh unveiling of the mystery and stuff to it um i don't know i i th- feel like some of his other stuff's just a lot more polished and and uh just more elusively creepy than this mm-hmm. for me it's um like a Whisper in Darkness because that's it, like and Shadow over Innsmouth because those are more atmospheric. Those are more you know they have this this deep horror element, but at the same time they feel more science fiction and they don't feel overexplained. Like I feel like with Mountains of Madness, I have this strange feeling that somewhat like I feel like um, Lovecraft himself was like I i wait i don't i don't think my i explain enough and when i did when he did he went overboard with it that's the i feel like he at some point went maybe i need to maybe i need to better describe what i'm doing here so people can actually get it yeah (sighs) yeah i can't help but feel like you know to be fair i think a lot of the explanation nature of the story is justified by who the characters are, given that they're all scientists exploring this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one, I don't know, man. It just gets it gets so into it. And, like, you know, the narrator keeps saying that he's writing this to try to caution other people and discourage them from going to explore the mountains of madness. But, like, put yourself in the shoes of a scientist 
How the fuck does does reading this story make you go, no, I'm not going to go disprove that this exists, or I'm not going to go out there and find what he's talking about? Yeah. What scientist is going to be turned off by this? It's just so... It's like both in character, but the whole premise is out of character. Um, yeah. Like I don't I, know. Like I said, the story uh, of uh, another version of this story that does this better is a novel called The Terror. And it's actually, like, the fun part is that it's loosely based off real events. Um, so there, there, um, there are these two British ships that were trying to find a way to China through Alaska, because uh, what what are what are geographics, right? <laughs> um, so they get stuck, and no one knew what happened to them after, um, after they lost contact with them. But in the novel, um, they're being chased by, like, this Inuit god of hunger. And it does follow a lot of Mountains of Madness, but the difference is it's a little more engaging, and there is a scientist there, but he's more of a medic, and you really get into the mindset of this cold isolation. And the one thing I'll give Mountains of Madness is that at least they they do kind of address that, yeah, even if there are no monsters there, this land wants you dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that... Um, I think... There's a, so they almost made a movie about it. This apparently, um, yeah, it, uh, it was Vital for It was um, Del Toro was trying to make a movie of this, but they defunded it in terms of the next Shrek movie. Yeah, I didn't know that about Shrek, but I knew it was Del Toro, and I honestly can't see how they could make this into a movie. I I don't see how they could make H.P. Lovecraft anything into a movie, like other they have. than well, like the the reanimator, right? No, they've done from a terror beyond the terror beyond. Um, oh. They've done Whisper and Darkness. Yeah, I'm actually surprised to know that they've there have been many film adaptations of H.P. Lovecraft because of how in in your head all the best stuff he does is like again colors out of space. I go to because the whole point is strange colors and just you you literally it is physically impossible to visualize that. It's it, you cannot physically show colors that you cannot see, yeah. but you can imagine that there are colors you cannot see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, and that's another, really like, interesting. Another movie that it's not officially a Lovecraft movie, but it's definitely Lovecraft. Um, it has Lovecraft elements. It's very clear. It's The Void, which <laughs> which honest to God, it it's more centered around like the Black Pyramid and the Tharna Hotep. Um, uh, even though you don't see Nitharna Hotep, you see the Black Pyramid. So that was the indication of, oh, this is Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And see, I like, don't know. Like, I just uh, go ahead, Ruben. I was gonna kind of echo what you said about the colors. Like, for me, a lot of these, like the gods in these stories, like the whole premise is like, oh, I looked in a pit and there's this two hundred foot tall squid, and then I went insane, and like. It sounds really scary if you're just reading prose because it, it's kind of like uh, a uh, creative writing class I took where somebody said uh, when you're watching a movie and then it shows a 700-foot-tall monster, then immediately your response is going to be, well, thank goodness, thank goodness it's not an 800-foot-tall monster. Like, you're immediately going to say, well, you know, it could be worse. And so when you're just imagining it in your mind it can be as awful as your brain allows it to be and in a movie it's just going to be okay that's just a giant squid and so like i feel like that's why i feel like it'd be really difficult to see this done in movies uh any hp lovecraft story now i know that like the reanimator was hp lovecraft i don't know anything about that corner of his brain uh and i didn't know that there was any uh of the Cthulhu stuff, the great old ones. I didn't know any of that had been done. Hell, there's, hell, hell Ruben, there's even a children's animated film trilogy called Howard Lovecraft, which features Cthulhu as a hero. I yeah, know. I know that, but that seemed like more... That seemed to just come along after Lovecraft got really popular post-South uh, Park. Um, Ruben, do me a favor real quick and just check your mic settings, see if you're on, like, full blast or something, because you're just coming through really loud. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. The, the, the in your head nature of Lovecraft stuff is what really works for it. And, and I feel that's what makes this seem so out of place. Um, is just 
there's it's it's not in your head. It's just perfectly described. He even gives measurements left and right. Uh, there's just so much factual figures given that. I mean, you can't keep those numbers in your head, certainly, but like you get a sense of scale and everything. No, and I don't know. It's just no. mostly about like going around a dead city, and I'm like, okay, I get it. It's a dead city. Now, to be fair, um, we are getting this from a scientist's perspective. So sometimes scientists do tend to overanalyze to gather research. So maybe we're getting, you know, maybe Lovecraft's idea was, hey, since I'm using a character who is a scientist, they would document it in this kind of in this kind of terms. No, you're um, definitely right, and I, I kind of danced around that a little bit earlier, but it was just like. <sighs> What's what's there's got to be a term for this where I realize that there's a conceit and an excuse for why the story is this way, but I don't care because it's still bad. Mm-hmm. Um, like I get that's what he's going for. It's still a mistake. Uh, it it still is so far a departure and makes it to my mind wholly uninteresting to read. Um, again, give me the abridged version of this any day, and even then it'll be kind of alright. Do you think this would have worked better if it was not a scientist then, as a main character? Possibly, it just depends on the way it'd be written then. Um, like, the the thing that gets me about the, the level of description here is so much of it just seems like, okay, how? How? Is that even conceivably the the kind of information that you're getting? He's getting all this information on the society based on sculptures that he's seen for the first time. Yeah. How can he possibly know that they lost the ability to go to space? Or they lost the ability to uh, create life from nothing? Like, how do you document that shit on a sculpture? Yeah, it just it, it just doesn't make sense if you think about it. There's just like no way. Like he says that the the sculpture techniques were were so far beyond anything humans had ever achieved. Okay, like techniques advanced enough to show that they lost the ability to fly in space and they they fought a war with Cthulhu. I'm sorry, just like that, that it should be beyond your ability to comprehend. Mm-hmm. It just there's an incongruity here, and it doesn't work. Um, what were you gonna say, Deadpoolzilla? I was just gonna say that um, maybe what have would have worked better is maybe have you have the scientist there, but maybe have like an assistant, or like you follow the perspective of like the scientist's assistant or someone, or like a guide, and have it that he doesn't, you know, he or she doesn't get it, get it. Um, from all this kind of techno babble that the sci- uh, that the scientist is spewing, and maybe that'd be a little more digestible um, for the story, rather than have everything over-explained. Yeah, yeah, that maybe would have been a good tip. Um, it's just like I, God, I we're gonna be grasping the, at straws at this one. No, no, we're fine. Um, I have the the complete HP Lovecraft here, and it's useful because it gives you just a little bit of background on some of these stories. So I want to read this paragraph that came before the Mountains of Madness in this volume. This extraordinarily evocative tale, the third and best of Lovecraft's short novels, makes use of a setting, the Antarctic continent, that had fascinated Lovecraft since childhood. When he had written treatises on the exploitations of Wilkes, Borkajevic, Scott, Amundsen, and others. Lovecraft also followed Admiral Byrd's exploration of 1928-30 with care. His frequent citations of the Himalaya artwork of Nicholas Rorich reflects the thrill he received at seeing Rorich's paintings in the Nicholas Rorich Museum in New York. Lovecraft was, however, devastated when Weird Tales rejected the story. It languished in manuscript for years until the young Julius Schwartz, acting as Lovecraft's agent, sold it to Astounding Stories, where it was serialized in February, March, and April 1936 issues. So obviously Lovecraft has a certain fascination with the Antarctic and explorations of it, and I can't help but feel like the reason so much of this is overexplained is because he wanted to show off how much he knew about the exploration of the region. Uh, and That's possible. 
Like, that's that's how it comes off to me, knowing that and then having read the story, is it's just like, oh, here's all the equipment we're bringing with us. Okay, yeah, he got that from from some actual, from, like, Bird's equipment list. Um, and, like, the setting is really cool and, and unforgiving and and just has an air of creepiness to it. And, like, it kind of creates the level of of doubt that would be necessary to go into, okay, yeah, our whole party died, but maybe it was just the environment that killed them. Mm-hmm. Maybe like it, it gives you that doubt of no, it's not really a killer. It, ge- it gives you that doubt, that little back of your head kind of thing, that that could give the conceit that they'd keep exploring. Um, and I do like that aspect of it. Yeah, um, that's also interesting that Julia Schwartz was uh, was involved with H.P. Lovecraft. I I didn't know that those two overlapped that much. Mm. I don't even know who that is off the top of my head. Uh, he was an editor at uh, DC. He kind of kicked off the Silver Age of DC Comics. Like he was the one oh. who kind of helped get like the Flash and Green Lantern, like Hal Jordan and Barry Allen. I don't know if he co-created them, but he was like he definitely was involved with those characters being created. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. So there's there's just like this this whole idea of the way in which he's trying to approach the story that I really really dislike and the descriptiveness but let's get into what what worked about the story so ultimately uh, I'm curious how everyone here feels about the twist why don't uh, why don't you start us off Ruben uh, so by the twist you just mean that like there at the end like the city is kind of almost becoming alive and like What's his name? The the grad student kind of just goes insane as they're flying away. Is that kind of what you? Because I was no, I mean, like okay, so the the story sets it up that Bird's team is wait no Lake's team sorry Lake's team is killed by the the uh, old ones that they thought were just fossils right yeah and then so you you expect the whole time that the reveal is going to be that the old ones are still alive and that they're still killing and that they're going to uh, attack the narrator and, and his companion. And that's what's going to make both of them go insane. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get the reveal at the very or near the very end that the old ones are all dead and that the Sagaths or Sagaths are the, the only thing left of their civilization besides the ruins Mm -hmm. that the Sagaths have like that the Sagaths um kind of had a revolution and killed all the old ones and now that's all that's left there is is the beasts of burden Mm -hmm. uh what would you guys think of that you know in a funny way it's almost like animal farm (laughs) yeah now now that you i never would have thought of that but now that you bring it up, yeah. Um, I never really... I guess since I had to have the... I had to have you remind me what the twist was, it didn't leave much of an impression on me. Uh, when you mentioned a twist earlier, I thought you were referring to the fact that uh, the grad student goes insane at the end, uh, or that something drives him insane, because uh, they see that, like, a third of the way into the story, and then they keep reminding you of, like, remember, my friend the grad student, he's gone crazy, and he won't tell me what he saw or what he thinks he saw, and then you don't really know what he saw, and so, like, I was expecting something to be really huge there at the end, and it was just kind of like, oh, we escaped, but then the grad student's crazy now. Um, like, I don't know, I was expecting something bigger than what we got, I guess. I don't know, I thought the reveal of the saga th- and, and like, the fact that they're all alive in the in the mountains themselves, like, they, they talk about how... Uh, he heard things coming from the caves when they were first landing the airplane, um, and that he looked out uh, the window of the plane and saw one of them, is is what's hinted at, that he saw another one in full daylight uh, when they were leaving the mountains. Um, I thought the reveal that the old ones were wiped out by their, their former slave beasts thing was a really really cool uh twist again i feel like it it's it's given way too much lead up but some of the lead up i quite like like they they spend so much time investigating and trying to comprehend all the sculptures and and 
grandiose style of the old ones. And then they get further and further down into this tunnel and they start to realize a decline in the the standard, the capability of the sculptures on the walls. And then you realize the Sagaths had no one to take after except for the old ones. And so they're imitating the old ones' culture in what they're uh, sculpting onto the walls mm-hmm. to the best of their ability. And so that was that was a really cool one. Again, it's it's like... I don't blame you if you miss that because it's so just drowned out in all this other detail. But I really did like that little that the way that is set up um, throughout because like they also see that the the old ones are really hesitant about breeding the Sugaths to to exist on land because they've been having problems with them and they don't want them to have too many extra organs or abilities and and they're afraid that breeding them for land will give them those and that'll that'll encourage independence. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know, just the way that, like, this this eons old race of colonizers is completely wiped out by their own creation to the point where, like, you know, fossilized-esque survivors are s- just shocked and murdered by the beast millions of years after the revolution occurred is really cool to me. I really did like those details. Mm-hmm. Uh, Deadpool Zola, how about you? What was your reaction to that twist? Uh, in a way, I almost felt like it was coming. Yeah? Uh, mostly because, like, um, the more they talked about the Shoggoths and everything, it, it, like, the whole decline, I was like, oh, I know where this is going. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say that it is interesting that... Um, just design-wise, the Shoggoths, who are this tentacle, writhing, eyes opening, it, they're such a weird creature in in in, in the Lovecraftian lore, and that's saying something. Um, but it's interesting to note that these creatures, like, would gained in, uh, something that you would not expect to have sentience or something to that degree would be these creatures that would form a like revolution of sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, you would not expect that, so that's what I've I like about Lovecraft stuff is because you wouldn't think that giant creatures um, that are just so like you'd think they'd almost be mindless in a way like the Shoggoths, and yet they have a level of intellect that not even man has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do like that, um, and so that that thing really worked for me. And I guess I'm the only one who is like super that that did enjoy the twist a lot. Um, but that part of it worked for me. Uh, I don't know, did Pulzilla, what about this really works for you? Just, like, despite its flaws, you really liked. I guess for me, it would be just the kind, uh, just the ice, uh, you, you really feel the isolation these, these people are feeling out in the cold, and, um, you really start to feel that, yeah, even without the creatures, this place would, would want to kill you. Like, you don't need monsters to murder people. Um, the cold can do it just fine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think, um, I think that if this story had done a little bit more with the characters, made me, just give me a little bit of information about these two guys, I think I would have been much more invested in seeing them get off, even though we already know, uh, because he's telling this story in retrospect, and he's talking about how his friend went insane from this trip, so we know they both survived, but if the if he just gave us a little bit of information about him, like you know, give us his name and tell us a little bit about them, I think I would have been much more I, I, on the edge of my seat. Like I really want to see these guys make it out of here, okay? Even though I know something's going to happen, um, and maybe it's just that this is from a time period where that didn't happen a whole lot. Uh, this was written in 1918, which is I mean, it's a hundred year old story now. So like maybe that kind of storytelling just wasn't a thing back then. Maybe. You know, I've read some old stories from even before this, and they didn't do that as much. Like, uh, you read, like, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It barely gives you anything on Captain Nemo. It doesn't give you hardly anything at all on your three other protagonists. So, like, maybe that's just not a thing that they did back then. And maybe if this story was written a little bit more recently, we would have had more of an investment. I would have had more of an investment in the protagonists. Okay. 
Um, the isolation thing, though, is really interesting. And again, I like that it, it does provide that excuse as to why they would press on. I mean, part of me the whole time is like that that person in the theater is like, no, don't go in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You get a case of the stupid white people syndrome. Oh, my God, so much. So <laughs> much. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was definitely interesting. Uh, Ruben, what's something about this that really worked for you? Um, well, I agree with you guys about the isolation. I, I think that under different circumstances, it really would have... I would have just probably blown through this in one sitting um, otherwise. But um, one thing, uh, it's not necessarily this story, but um, the ending of where talking about the best... Fr- or not the best friend, but the grad student who goes crazy because he turns around and he sees something... Uh, it reminds me of the 1990s uh, TV adaptation of It, uh, Stephen King's It. I don't know if you guys have seen that, and I don't remember if this was in the book It or not. But uh, we've all seen that version of It. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the the part where the main character is talking about the guy who committed suicide. I don't remember any of their names, but he was talking about when they were kids. They were running from It, and he said, you know, his friend saw something, but he never told him what it was. And, like, it shows him looking back at the camera, like, while they're running away from it, and the audience never finds out what it was. And I really like that. Like, I feel like Stephen King, and I know that he's a pretty big fan of H.P. Lovecraft, or he he's at least, uh, like, kind of a Lovecraftian scholar, uh, but I feel like he had to have drawn some influence from H.P. Lovecraft. And even, like, looking at a lot of Stephen King's works where... Like, it's all kind of, a lot of his stuff is set in the same universe, and a lot of it is some ancient evil that's in Maine. And, you know, it. I feel like you wouldn't have a lot of those Stephen King stories without H.P. Lovecraft. And I, I guess something that I've enjoyed about reading not just this story, but a lot of the other H.P. Lovecraft stories, is getting to see uh, how it has affected pop culture since then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that storytelling device is very... It's not wholly unique to Lovecraft, but he kind of he kind of owns it, you know, of someone goes mad just from looking at the one thing that they weren't supposed to. They just got a little bit too much and it's it's too much for their brain to comprehend. It's, and that's really cool. Mm-hmm. It's almost like very much like with, you know, the Mar- with uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where you delve in it, someone delves too far into something they cannot mentally grasp and pay for it dearly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so that's that is a really cool aspect of it though. The, and and I do like it's seated again, it's too much. It's too much. It's too much is kind of my thing for this, but I do like how he keeps saying and poor Danford mm-hmm. won't still till this day won't tell me what he saw. Like that he just keeps going back to that it's done too much, but it's really cool and ominous because you just keep wanting to flip through and know what the hell did he see, um, and you want to like know. And like it's, it's cool that this is written the way it is in that first person perspective because, dude knows what his friend saw, mm-hmm. he just can't bring himself to admit it. And um, and you mentioned earlier that uh, this is not going to do anything to dissuade other scientists from going to the mountains. This is also not going to do any favors for Danford because now everyone who reads this is going to be like harassing Danford saying, hey, dude, what did you see? Uh, they're like Danford's never going to have a moment of peace again in his life outside <laughs> of the fact that he's like had a mental breakdown from going to the mountains. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was interesting while I was reading these last couple chapters before I figured out what the uh, Sugath reveal was going to be. Um I had, like, a completely different ending in mind for this that would not have been Lovecraftian at all, but it would have been a really cool ending. So I'm just going to pitch it because, I don't know, when else am I going to get the chance to talk about it? (laughs) So as they kept going further and further down the tunnel, I was really, like, thinking, how fucked would it be if they get to, like, the very end of the tunnel and they're just the eight resurrected old ones sitting there trying their damnedest to just move rocks away from a a collapsed end of the tunnel uh because they're just trying and trying and trying to get home 
or maybe like they'd started to move rocks and then it collapsed on them more and and like one was still alive and pinned under the rubble and like the narrator came up to him and saw what it like clearly understood that it was an intelligent being and they connected at first and the narrator like pulled out a gun and like shot one of the penguins that was around the place uh so that the old one could see it and then handed the gun to the old one so it wouldn't have to suffer anymore Hmm. like i just was thinking about like god that'd be like i was really thinking that's where this might go because so much of the story was about the decline of the civilization and and realizing you know their humanity realizing that it has betters um i was really interested to see if like lovecraft was going to do something kind of atypical and that maybe the the shock of seeing all the dead um old ones or something was going to be what made danforth go crazy i don't know but like just that idea was kind of creeping in the back of my head of like this could be a really somber ass ending that could be really really interesting uh but they didn't go for it and i was like ah damn that would have been cool as shit <laughs> yeah that would have um, been very interesting and, and like you said probably not something that hp lovecraft would have been interested in doing um but nope. yeah, yeah yeah his i guess i mentioned earlier that like i've always been really interested in the mythos of like the old ancient alien gods that are like sleeping under the continent like of earth and like there's cults and stuff like that that's all been really fascinating to me for like a long time but reading these stories i'm realizing that that is not really what hp lovecraft was interested in and looking into it like i'm seeing a lot of scholars say that hp lovecraft suffered from depression and that a lot of these stories were very much like his way of kind of conveying that and like not just depression but like he was very much a hermit like he just wanted to stay away from society and he just wanted to keep himself isolated and so this a lot of these stories kind of portray that that fear of you know going out into society i guess and so i'm realizing that the thing that i found myself most interested in is the it's more just like a plot gimmick and it's not so much like what the stories are about and the stories what they're about it can be some it's something that a lot of people are probably going to connect with but it's also not something that i would be as interested in reading about Mm -hmm. i think that's fair um the the call of cthulhu is the one that i think does that the most where it's just about the the idea that all the religious cults and and underground sects and stuff are all related to each other and all worshiping the same thing that's that's what all call of cthulhu is about um this has the least to to do with cthulhu out of arguably any of his stories in the cthulhu mythos like obviously he's got his early works like beast in the cave that have nothing to do with this Mm -hmm. uh nothing to do with cthulhu but like in the this is definitely in the cthulhu mythos and it gets mentioned and cthulhu gets mentioned but like this is all about a completely separate race that like it dealt with cthulhu but it didn't die because of cthulhu Mm -hmm. it just died because of its own arrogance um and that was really interesting uh but yeah call of cthulhu has a lot more to do with what you're talking about and i see why you wanted to review that instead but like i said we already done it at one point um right (sighs) do you think um do you think that this um so you both said that this is like one of his weaker stories right in my opinion uh, i haven't read all of his stuff but it's this is the thing i've read of his that i enjoyed clearly the least that's really interesting to me because like i said like i've only read a few of them i i read dagon which was like a five page story i read i don't know i'm i'm pronouncing how did you pronounce it deadpool was it nyarla thotep yeah um i read that one and then i read this one and i feel like i read one more whose name i can't remember but like they all just kind of feel the same to me. So that's, I I may need to just try and just soldier on and read some more if they do get better. Because uh, uh, I was, honestly, after reading this one, I was thinking about, like, just giving up on him uh, after reading this one. Cause, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys like some that are quite, a, that you think are quite a bit better than this one. Oh, I definitely think so. Again, I would say, um, 
Read Colors Out of Space. That's a really, really good standalone one that doesn't really have much to do with anything. It's just a really creepy-ass story that gets in your head. Mm-hmm. Um, like, that's... That's the thing that he's so good at, is just playing with your perceptions of how storytelling works. Um, and this is, like, so not in his wheelhouse. This feels like... This feels like the George Lucas version of an H.P. Lovecraft story. <laughs> um, and no, like, that's, that's this story is very much Lucas's style, though. Mm-hmm. Of, you know, oh, there's adventurers, archaeologists going through a cave, and then they have to run away from a big monster. Yeah. Um, that's just so much more in his wheelhouse than, than it is in, in Lovecraft's. Uh, all right, so here's a, a topic um, that's, that's going to be fun to talk about. How is this story indicative of H.P. Lovecraft's racism? Yeah, so I've been in reading in reading up on well in getting into these HP Lovecraft stories, I've also been looking at like scholarly thought on it and a lot of people are like, by the way, he was really racist and xenophobic and you cannot like a lot of people will just open up their critical analysis saying like, Did you know HP Lovecraft is racist? Okay, now it's time to talk about his story. And I think a lo- at least so far, the ones I've read, I mean, you'll have him mention, like, the Mad Arab, and I don't know if that's racist or if that's just him saying this guy is an Arab and he just happens to be mad. Um, but uh, then... I I think it was the former more than the latter. <laughs> okay. And I, I got to be real. <laughs> I got to be real with you. Yeah, I mean, I, and that's uh, the Nyarlathotep, right? That's the who he's talking about there? No, it was Abdul Absan. Oh, see, yeah, I'm, it all borders together for me. Um, so, like, he'll mention that, but I think as far, I don't know about if this is so much racism as just his, uh, uh, like, him wanting to stay at home and, like, keep everyone away from him. But, like, it seems like most of these stories involve, like, somebody goes to a strange place and then something really horrible happens to them and they would have been better off if they had just stayed at home. And, like... I watched a documentary, a little bit of a documentary about H.P. Lovecraft after reading this where it was like talking about how much he hated just like leaving his comfort zone, how he just wanted to stay at home. And that that reached out and included like his disdain of other like like how he was anti-Semitic and like he just uh, talked about like just some really horrible things about people coming to America Um, and. I don't know if that lasted his entire life because... uh, No, it did. It did. (laughs) Okay, well, I was going to say the woman he married and eventually divorced, she was Jewish. So uh, it might have softened some, maybe. And, you know, it's the old racist exceptionalism. This is one of the good Jews um, kind of thoughts. Don't worry, you're one of the good ones. Um, You know, it's subtle, Sometimes, like, sometimes you have, like, oh, the Mad Arab, or, or in this, he's got, like, the... It's weird, because it, it seems like he might even be acknowledging the contradiction, but he kind of... I, I don't think he's smart enough to realize it. Like, he... At one point, he names off all of these, um, like, famous cultures who have worshipped or idolized animals in some way, shape, or form... Like, he mentions, like, Rome with the eagle and, and uh, you know, Egypt with the cat and stuff like that. And, and keeping in mind, he probably didn't know that Egyptians were black, but whatever. Um, <laughs> like, he, he, he names all these off, and then he goes, and then the way that savage tribes worship animals and totems, I'm like... Okay, how is it any different though? <laughs> like, like what is what's what's the distinction there? So, like, you know, he's got the the more um, I don't know if microaggression is the right term, but the more like just ignorance based racism there, where he's unable to see. I feel his own um, preconceived notions and and belittlings of other races. But then there's the more like I think it's subtly contextualized. Um, let me let me put it this way. The old ones are the French colonists. The Sugaths are the um, Creole slaves. 
and the tragedy is the Haitian Revolution. Okay. Do you see the kind of parallel that it draws here? Like, like he spends this whole book, um, or this whole story, sorry, building up how unbelievably amazing the society of the old ones was, and the tragedy is that they were overthrown by their slaves. Um, like that's that's the thing. Like the the shocking, scary part is not that the old ones have survived and have built a city underwater to to continue to thrive in. Is that everything they built was destroyed by a lesser race, and that's where like the the racist kind of ideology kind of works its way into the story. So, like if you can, and I think it's certainly doable. I think it's more doable with Lovecraft, given that he's talking about fucking weird aliens and monsters and shit, than it is with other writers. Like, like you cannot fucking read Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs and not just go, "This guy was racist as fuck." Um, but like, it's easier to do with Lovecraft because it's monsters and aliens. And so the metaphor is, is a bit, you know, it's a bit looser. Um, but I think it's there. I think there's an idolization of colonization and imperialism and a disdain for so-called serving race, slave races. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the horror is that the slave race got their freedom um and and destroyed a great civilization for it and like i don't know so i'm i'm in this weird part where i'm like yeah i actually did like that that twist of the story when you don't think about it in connection to lovecraft's apparent racism and disdain for other cultures but i i can't help but think of that now that i know lovecraft is kind of a piece of shit as a human being and i'm glad he's dead <laughs> uh i don't know Dimplezilla, what's your reaction to all this you've been quiet well i've just been kind of listening because i really don't have anything much else to add other than what you guys have said yeah yeah mo but i will say that it, it you know as a for as you know it is kind of disheartening the more you learn about hp lovecraft i was like god damn it i really loved your work and now this is i feel it feels a little tainted for me mm-hmm yeah, and I mean, like, that's how I felt, because I didn't really know that much about him when I first read uh, the the three stories Milan had us review. And, like, I was really, really into him. And then at one point, I was talking to Bill again about him, and he goes, yeah, like, you, if you think about it, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth is Lovecraft's whole thing on why couples, why races shouldn't interbreed. And I'm like, holy fucking shit it is fuck <laughs> um, it's like a whole treatise on on what he thinks the dangers of in of cross breeding are and so it's just like damn this guy would have been super tight with hitler mm. uh, i don't know it's it's certainly disappointing um you know and that's the thing is you get disappointed in the writer uh sometimes and and that's the way i felt about it so it's definitely here in this. Again, I feel like with Lovecraft, I have an easier time removing the the social and and bigoted views that he had and definitely instilled in his work. I have an easier time parsing those out than I do in other people's. Like again, I I think the the because they were contemporaries. I think the other go to example is Tarzan. Have either of you read Bur Burroughs' original Tarzan? Yeah, we we've been over this, Ian. Oh, I didn't remember. Shit, I don't remember every conversation I have. <laughs> I, I have not. <laughs> I told. I rem I clearly remember telling you that on November the first of twenty sixteen. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, oh well, Ian's have Alzheimer's. Better put him down. <laughs> <laughs> I have not read Tarzan. I have read a couple of his Mars books. Okay. Well, yeah, like... and those are equally as like a little racy. But here's my takeaway from it. While people like Burroughs and Lovecraft do have their, you know, uh, view, their, shall we say, less than kind view, I like to think that their characters they've created have kind of transcended their own views to be molded into um, something new. I think why we keep coming back to Lovecraft is because, not well, not just because it's public domain, mind you, but because, um, but because it has it has become its own entity, and it's not. I don't feel like it 
I said, you know, it feels his work feels a little tainted, but at the same time, you can you can easily mold stuff a little differently to distance yourself from those views, and and create something new from it. That was the whole thing of Lovecraft: is that this universe is a giant sandbox. You know, when you think about it, it's a giant sandbox of ooze and gross and tentacles. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when you're playing in the sandbox and a fucking tentacle comes in and it goes well, that was the you only for one. life? <laughs> it, and, uh, it goes up your ass and it doesn't even offer to give you dinner. <laughs> right the uh. But yeah, you, you guys understand what I'm saying, right? Like, no, yeah, no, not... I definitely do. Um, and again, I th I feel like it's a much easier thing to do that with Lovecraft than with uh, again Burroughs and Tarzan because. Tarzan just has some shit where, like, there's a character in the original Tarzan just called the Negress. Mm. And and she straight has lines like, oh, lordy, there's some hip elephopotamuses out there. And I'm like, I'm not even lying. That's, that's a direct line from the book. And I had to stop reading at that point for just a few minutes to collect myself. <laughs> um, but at the same time, there's definitely some interesting stuff in Burroughs, but end of the day tarzan's able to be tarzan and and the king of the jungle not because of the the inherent strength of man or the the ability of the human intellect no he's able to do it because he's a white man of proper breeding and it's like god that sucks mm -hmm. that's just odd ah, just ruins the whole fucking thing um so like that's that's the the thing is though all of the racism is the Tarzan story. And, like, people have tried to do things with it after the fact, and it's worked to varying degrees. But the the end of the day, what made Tarzan Tarzan was the racism. Lovecraft's stories work without the racism and arguably work better. Um, Like, Shadow Over Innsmouth is a story about, in Lovecraft's mind about the dangers of interbreeding. I think you can approach that story in a modern context, and it's about more than that. I feel like you can make an argument that Shadow of Rinsmith is a story about the fears associated with the, the strange and the unknown, more than it is about directly what Lovecraft meant for it to be about. I feel you can do the same here. Yes, this is a story that kind of idolizes uh, imperialism and stuff. I think you could arguably take this and turn it on its head and say this is a story that cautions against imperialism because no matter what great society you could build from it, if you build it on the backs of something of someone else, that will come back to haunt you. Uh -huh. And I feel like that's a pretty good argument for, against imperialism, if, depending on how you want to interpret it. Um, so the story isn't the racism with Lovecraft is, is I think the thing that's, ma that makes it able to endure in a different way. Yeah. And, and I'm always real bad about like, well, I, and I've never read Tarzan. I'm sure I would have picked it up on it there, but like here, I never, I, I don't think I would have picked up on a lot of the, the themes like, like you were talking about Shadow over Innsmouth. I probably wouldn't have picked up on that unless somebody specifically pointed it out to me and said this is what this stands for this is what that stands for a lot of times stuff like that won't really it goes way over my head unless i read it multiple times or unless somebody just specifically says this is what it was about no that's fair and it definitely went over my head the first time um i i did have to have someone point it out to me before i went ah oh, shit yeah. <laughs> just the the illusion was just shattered <laughs> um Oh, just just ruining things, and that's what we do in the in the two thousands. We just ruin things. Um, like it, it, I don't know. I think it's definitely worth though. Just you know, you mentioned Ruben that every think piece on Lovecraft mentions he's a racist. I do think that's worthwhile, and like that's what makes me really uncomfortable about the Howard Lovecraft animated movies. I just found out those were a thing. I'm like, I'm fine if we want to revive and and use Lovecraft's world. That works for me. We no, we shouldn't idolize Lovecraft in that way. We should not put him on a pedestal in that way. 
yeah, the man died poor and that sucks, but you know what? I can think of worse pe- I can think of better people that it could have happened to. Um, yeah, I mean, Poe was, Edgar Allan Poe was it a total piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know, it's just, just shit like that. I'm like, ah, no, I don't, I don't like the idea of Lovecraft being praised and like, you know, he's one of those people who I'm kind of glad never got famous in his own time. <laughs> I I make this comparison a lot, and it is a little too harsh on Alan Moore. But I really wish Alan Moore was one of those artists who, like, produced just a shit ton of work, but didn't get famous until after he died. Because mm. he's an Man, that asshole. Is... <laughs> <laughs> like, every time I hear Alan Moore talk, I'm just like, fucking really? Just shut up. <laughs> um... Like your work's so good. You're just such an ass. Um and and Lovecraft is is one of those guys I'm like, God, I'm glad that you never got famous during your lifetime. Um cuz you don't you didn't deserve to be famous. You just you know, good actually, for you for making some shit. There's actually a comic called Lovecraft and Tesla where they it's Lovecraft and Nikola Tesla going on adventures together and I'm like, I don't know if I could read this because only one of these people are really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I feel like, the, I, I don't like glossing over what an awful person Lovecraft was. And yeah, I get it, like, it was it was the time. Like, you can't expect everyone to to not be a product of our time, of their time. You are a product of the society in which you live in, and if everyone around you is encouraging views of anti-Semitism and racism and stuff, it's not unheard of to internalize those views. I don't care. Uh <laughs> Like, like I'm, I'm aware well, of the context. Cool. I just don't give a fuck. <laughs> I mean, it's still cool to like Tesla. He wasn't a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's just, just death of the author is a complicated subject, but you know, whatever. So, sometimes um, they, sometimes the author makes it much easier to separate them from the work, and sometimes it's not as easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think so. I usually uh, I usually try to try to say I'm going to keep their political or their their whatever opinions away from it but sometimes if it's in the work then it's really impossible to do that. Yeah, yeah, like some guys can can write like we talked about this with Orson Scott Card uh when we did a, a Christmas episode last year. He wrote a really really good Christmas story called Homeless oh, yeah. in Hell. I w- Oh yeah, I was a part of that. Yeah, yeah. And like I mean, it's a really good story, and then, and it has nothing to do, as far as I can tell, with most of Orson Scott Card's bigoted-ass views. Uh, so that's an easier one to read without without Orson Scott Card really uh, gaining anything from it. But, I don't know. It's, it's a complicated beast. Um, let's get back to the story a little bit before we wrap up, because we've got another couple minutes to go here. Um... So even though this is all really, really descriptive and we've all kind of agreed that that's a big problem for it, uh, is there anything in all of the descriptiveness that like you really, that really did work for you of like, oh wow, it's so cool to find out all these details about this world. Um, cause like for me, like I said, I really liked the details that seeded the, the Suggoth revolution. Um, I thought that was really, really cool the way that all kind of set itself up as, and really, really slowly it built up that way. Um, how about you guys? I did like what you mentioned earlier about where he's looking at the entire history of this culture and it's like, you know, showing, and I just, like you, I was thinking, wait a minute, how does he, like, there were points where I actually had to go back and look at the story and see if I had missed anything because he's suddenly talking about this, the history of this culture and these uh, entities. And I'm thinking, how did he know that? And I'm thinking maybe I missed something where somebody is like telling him all this stuff, but then it's like, Nope, he's just reading it off of a pillar or whatever. And so like, I liked a lot of that, but I almost wish we had a thing where it's like, and then this, you know, this, a tall statue telepathically beamed all this information into their head or something like that. And then we could have had all this information and it would have been presented in such a way where it would have made more sense in the story. Maybe. I think that's fair to, but to be fair to the story, I feel like they do maybe lay some groundwork for that. Um, Because he does at several points mention 
the possibility of being under some kind of hypnosis. Um, and he does strictly mention that the the old ones were telepathic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there might be a little groundwork for why he was able to read all this off the statues. I think it's it's not established well enough, but I do think it might be there. Okay, How yeah. about you, Deadpoolzilla? Uh, I, I like, again, you guys have been really um, knocking it out of the park and pretty much saying what everything I want to say about in this regard, so <laughs> I just got to agree with Ian on this one. Okay, all right. I'm right as always. Um, <laughs> hey, I, 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 I'd rather not argue with a genius or a man <laughs> who pretends to be. <laughs> uh, you're, you're gonna get there one day you'll come up with a sick burn one day <laughs> um maybe it'll be half as good as that one anyway um you can go fuck yourself on that <laughs> one of the other details i did like i thought it was really interesting to get the description of lake's dissection mm-hmm. i thought that was really cool and, like, if that's all the detail, if that would had been, like, the most detailed scene, that would have been really great. It took me right back to reading Dracula and and the scenes where um, Van Helsing's dissecting uh, Lucy. Like, that's what it reminded me of so much, and I really, really liked that. Uh, it, it's just detailed and gross enough, and it's also got the weirdness, especially with late questioning... Like, I don't even know... Like, Lake has a point where he's like, I'm not sure if I'm looking at an animal or a vegetable. Mm-hmm. And that's real... Like, that... The the fact that it comes from a scientist makes you just go, that's fucking weird. Um, and it's it's a really cool distinction to, to throw in there. Um, let me ask you guys this, then. Are the old ones, like, too powerful in this? Do you think that's they're, what like... I've always had that problem with with, um, with Lovecraft characters is that they feel a little too powerful in cases. Like, yeah, okay, if you were this godlike, why didn't you just take over the Earth sooner? You know. Um, well, I mean, I think the argument is they did take over the Earth. They were well, the me, undisputed rulers of the Earth for like two hundred million years. Well, keep it in mind the longest human empire is is a. Uh, Egypt at three thousand years, so that's a that's quite a, a beat. <laughs> um, well, I would say they're not too powerful because the Slagovs or the Slagovs they overthrew them. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I'd say they were they may have been too powerful in the backstory, but then, like, the whole point of this story, like you said, is that they were overthrown. Yeah. I don't know. To me, some of it's just like it, like the the feats are a little too ridiculous as described. And to be fair, they are getting this information from the stories these people told about themselves. So you can say unreliable narrator all you want. I think that's maybe being a bit too generous to the story, though. But like, they create life out of nothing on a whim when they first show up on Earth mm-hmm. to just build their empire. They fly through space just with their biological wings they they can just just some of that stuff it's like okay come the fuck on Mm -hmm. that's just too much it's just like like manipulating the the beginnings of life on earth and and accidentally creating humanity is one thing just creating life out of thin air is just a little too much to me or it begins to get a bit too silly um, it's so just I'm, like the the power scaling is just too much. So I'm guessing I'm you sorry, didn't what? care much for me. I was about to say. What? I I said you did. Then I guess you didn't care much for Prometheus. Then. N- no one cared much for Prometheus. <laughs> Good. That's the that, that's the answer I wanted. <laughs> um. That's the best burn of the night. <laughs> Um, yeah. Now, I I had a question. Um, since we're still wanting to kill a little bit of time on this one, um, I I read this story. Well, I read most of it Monday, um, and then tonight I was re- kind of rereading uh, reading the Wikipedia article, just kind of familiarize myself with it in case I forgot anything. And 
uh, at one point in the story, and I didn't even pick up on this when I was reading it, but then looking at the Wikipedia article, I was wondering if either of you guys did. It talks about how when they find all the dead bodies, and it's like one of the one of the humans is missing, and a couple of the dogs are missing, and I guess maybe the story wants you to think that the missing human is the one who did this massacre, and then later they find his body, and it's like, oh, okay, who killed him then? Were either of you for a minute thinking that he was the one responsible for this? No, but I thought that I bought that the characters could maybe be holding on to that hope. Okay. Um, I I wouldn't say it's misdirection for you, the reader, especially given the context of he keeps talking about how, like, what he saw drove him to the brink, drove him to the brink of insanity. I had no doubt in my mind that it was going to be some Lovecraftian beast, that it wasn't just going to be a human responsible for all this. Um, that being said, some of the the stuff that was going down in the background, I'm like, okay, yeah, I believe that they're holding on to the hope that this was all a human the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe that doubt, I guess I'd say. And maybe if I didn't know that this was H.P. Lovecraft, if you just told me to read this story and you refused to let me Google it or find out who wrote it, I might have been thinking that, hey, this human being who's missing, he's probably the guy who's killing these people. But then, like you, knowing it's H.P. Lovecraft, I'm immediately going to think, okay, it's a giant squid demon hiding on the other side of the sun, and he killed these people, or something like that. Yeah, and like for me, the the twist, again, is the Sagath, Sagath reveal. And I thought the whole time that, you know, they were going to be holding on to the hope that it was the the other member of the, the expedition team. And then, like, right toward the end, as they were leaving the city, um, the, the younger companion was going to, like, look back and just catch a glimpse of one of the old ones still alive. Or, or get some kind of confirmation that the, the fossilized old ones rose up. Um, and that's not what happens at all. And so that kind of worked for me. It's, I think it was kind of Lovecraft being a little bit aware of his himself, but still playing to his tropes because, um, just in his other stories, that's all it would take is just a glimpse of the old ones. And instead of that, you get the, the confirmation that the old ones were defeated by their own folly. And that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why I consider that the twist, I guess, but whatever. Um, Deadpoolzilla, how about you? Did you get buy into that at any point reading this? First time, second time, whatever? Not really. I was, I was like, dude, I was like, it's Lovecraft. I know it's already going to be a creature. There is no goddamn way it's going to be just a human. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's almost like a, a, a Shyamalan twist. I would not expect that. I was not. I I was in no point like thinking, oh, it's definitely going to be a man. What the twist? What the twist? <laughs> I don't know. To be fair, that Lovecraft did use that shit. The Beast in the Cave. Come on. Um, to, yeah. Well, to I also be fair. That was his. Kid. That was also his first story. So you know. Did you guys? Uh, he... Did you guys ever see the movie Sunshine with uh, Killian Murphy and Chris Evans? Yes, where it's like fucking randomly turns into a slasher movie for no goddamn reason. Yeah, um, it's been forever since I've seen that, but that's kind of sort of like Lovecraft in space, isn't it? Like, it, it's a lot like this story, except instead of going to Antarctica, they're going to the sun, right? Mm, no, I would disagree. Okay. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen that movie, but I'm just, as we were talking about it, I was starting to think of like, that movie had another crew on another ship, and they all died. And then, uh, like, I don't know. It. I felt like there's. I some... would say Event Horizon is more Lovecraft in space. Okay, I haven't seen that. I need to watch that. You don't really. Oh. Um, <laughs> like, there's a good movie in there somewhere, and maybe like twenty years from now, we'll get a proper director's cut. But. You don't really need to see it, okay. as is. Uh, aside to see Lawrence Fishburne aged, like, overnight, because I think Event Horizon comes came out in, like, 2002. No, Event Horizon came out in, like, 98, and then Matrix came out in, like, 99, 2001, and Lawrence Fishburne somehow ages 10 years in between those two films. It is ridiculous. <laughs> um, the dude looks... 
completely different. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So on that note, why don't we go ahead and go on to ratings? Uh, I'll go first. I'll give this 2.5 out of 5. Uh, mm, headless old ones. Okay. Um, Deadpool Zilla, you want to go next? I will give... Th- I will give this two writhing masses of planimals out of five. <laughs> um, I, I guess I didn't like this as much as you guys. I will give this one out of five dead dogs. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right. Well, Deadpool Zola, we need a topic discussion for next week, sir. Well, um, my topic discussion and I think you both find this interesting, is the subject of supervillains becoming heroes. Nice. Sounds good. All right. Well, we'll talk about that next week. Everyone, see you there. Until next time, I'm the Philosopher. I am the Don Juan of Comic-Con. And I'm the Comics Kid 2099. And we are your geeky gentlemen. And we will be discussing things. Thank you.